turn 60 and your hearing starts to fail. But it's such a joy. It's a joy for me to present my son in faith. Uh, it, it, it's amazing how we connected together in the very beginning, how we met. We actually met over um, the building that we were vacating in Garfield. And at that time, they needed a place uh, to worship. And they had honored that property. And the Lord has blessed them there. But they outgrew the property. And they are, they're still in Garfield uh, ministering there. Pastor Chris has a tremendous prophetic anointing. But most of all, you will, you will, you know, some prophets come, I call them the hit and run people. They come in, they give you the word, and it's, sometimes it's a little bit on the harsh side, and they kind of take off and leave the pastor to kind of, you know, soak up the wounds. But that's not this brother. This brother delivers the word of the Lord, and he does it in perfect love. And so I'm just so grateful that this morning I'm able to have with us, we're able to have with us, Pastor Chris, my son in the faith. Pastor Chris Kalal, would you come? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. After all that amazing introduction, I don't even know what I'm going to do with myself. Um, that's just, I feel i feel beyond you know, honored to, to listen to that. And um, I was planning to beat people up today, but now I can't do it because he said I'm going to do things in perfect love. <laughs> so now I, I have to be really sweet because he said I was sweet. And uh, what am I going to do? You know, what was it? What am I, what am I going to do? Um, but I'm, I'm beyond happy to be here. And one of the reasons why is because I'm in, I'm in family's house. I get, I get the opportunity to preach all over the world. Um, I've even been doing some trips with Jeremy um, when I was a little thinner. When I was a little thinner. But um, I have had, I've had the opportunity to preach all over the world. But when you preach at home, when you preach at someone, at a church that you love, you preach very differently. You speak very differently. And I don't necessarily think I'm going to preach tonight. I mean, I'm sorry, not tonight, this morning. I, I want to share with you. I want, I want to share some stuff. And why do I say that? There's a difference between a preaching. A preaching is something that you, uh, you prepare 10 hours and you, and you put it in a specific order. But when I share something that's in my heart, and this is not hours. These are years and days and weeks and months and experiences that, I'm, that I've had. And um, and really beyond beyond um, beyond honored to be with you this this morning. Um, I want to consider. Excuse me one second, because I just we we switch pulpits because throughout the years I've noticed that I'm really too short for that one. <laughs> we have that one in the church, and I use it only when we have guests. In. But it's like the Bible's right here in my face. And um, and I, I really I really want to um, I really want to be able to see this today. Can we consider the book of Luke chapter four? Yeah. And even even you know talking about that, Nadia looks at me and she says, "You have your pastor face on today." You know what that really means? I am looking older. <laughs> That's what it really means. So um, I'm 32 years old. I've been pastoring for 11 years this year. So I, I do have a pastor face now. So what tends to happen to pastors, and you guys are allowed to laugh, okay? You guys can, you guys can interact with me. I'm not going to bite you. Um, what tends to happen to us is that we start off skinny. I was 127 pounds when I started off. And then throughout the years, we gained 10 pounds a year. Everybody, you know. So you, you get to choose. And in the list of things, it says you either keep your hair or you get fat. I'm too short, so I decided to keep my hair. <laughs> Come on. Now, the other pastor decided to keep the six pack. <laughs> Jeremy, you have to choose. Because <laughs> you're on the same boat. Right. Well, you want the chunkiness or you want to keep the hair? Which one? <laughs> Jeremy says, I think it's better for me to shave my hair. I'll still have the muscles. It's not up to you at this point. It's up to Jessica. Whatever she wants to keep is what you're going to choose. So, um, Jessica, you want the hair or you want the muscles? Both. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can't because I'm too short. 
<laughs> so I kept the hair and I said, you know what, someone's going to have to love a little bit of extra. <laughs> so, um, this is going to be the weirdest verse I've ever preached on. But we're considering Luke 4, verse 38. And this is actually, yeah, Luke chapter 4, verse 38. And um, this is going to be really funny. Okay? You guys ready? Come on. And he rose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill. She was about to go. She had a high fever. And they appealed to him on her behalf. And when he stood over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve him. Okay. Simon's mother-in-law was sick. This was Peter or Simon's way out. This was Simon's way of just life. Completely like having no mother in law and living life without her. Jesus walks into his house, sees the sick woman, and heals her. Okay, why am I talking about Jesus healing a mother in law? To some of you, that might be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> You're like counting the days she's going, she's gone, she's getting rid of her, this is it, this is the best, this has never happened to me. And this is probably why Peter denied Jesus three times. <laughs> <laughs> because mother-in-law was healed, like I'm not, I don't like this dude. I actually believe that this is the reason why he was a little bitter with Jesus throughout his ministry. <laughs> because the first thing that he does in the life of Simon and people don't really read their scriptures so they don't understand this, is healed the mother-in-law. So then the next chapter, Jesus is walking to him while he's working. He says, you already went to my house, and now you're you coming to me while I'm on the boat, and he's, work, he's working. Now I have to share this with you. Peter or Simon, because they're the same guy, they didn't go, he didn't go to fishing college. He didn't go to University of Fishing. He didn't go to the... UFCA, the University of Fishing College of America. No, he didn't do that. He was a fisherman because that's what his father taught him to do. It was a trade. He probably started from a young boy. You have to understand, they didn't even know how to read back in the days. It was, they were born, they were taught the trade of the family, they all did that for generations. And here comes Peter, Simon, and he's doing what he always did every single day. And Jesus doesn't walk to him while he's in the synagogue. Jesus doesn't walk to him while he's at church. Jesus doesn't walk to him at a conference. Jesus will walk to him through a Puerto Rican on a Sunday morning in a rainy day. Um, funny that you guys bring a Hispanic on Cinco de Mayo. Wonderful. <laughs> you did it for this. I understand. <laughs> this is exactly what you did. So, I'm also Italian. So, check this out. This didn't happen that way. This happened on a day that he least expected. It was probably a Tuesday at, and it was already a long day of fishing. And he was, and Jesus walks in. And Jesus already had fame because he healed mother-in-law. And Jesus walks into the scenario and he says to Simon in the next chapter, in chapter 5. He says to Simon, so I've seen you've been fishing all day and I'm going to give you my commentary on this. You've been fishing all day long. He says, yeah, I've been, you know. He says, you caught nothing. And here comes the, you have to understand this. Jesus was from Nazareth. There was no water around this area. Here he comes to the sea. Where here he's hanging out with some fishermen. And Jesus was a carpenter. He smelled like wood. He was a carpenter. He probably was the one who built the boat that Peter was sitting on. Jesus was in that area. And he says to him, why don't you cast your nets onto the other side? He says, cast them. And, and if you read it in its original language, it's not net. It's nets. N-E-T-S. Like the New Jersey nets that left us to Brooklyn. Why don't you cast your nets in? Simon says, I've been fishing all day. He's going to say, listen, in other words, let me give you some drama behind this. You are a carpenter. You are not a fisherman. You can't tell me what to do. Do you know how many times, beloved, I go to, I go to nations and I go to places and there's pastors that have been doing things for years. And I'm not talking about yours. Who have been doing things for years. There's people who, are, who have been preaching longer than I've been alive. Okay, they have baptized more people than there are in the island of, of, of Guam. Okay, they're, they're, they have done so much. They have a trajectory of, of just years. And here comes the little guy, 
God always uses the little guy. It's just so funny how he uses a short little dude to tell him, you need to do this, this, and this. And they go to me and go, well, who are you? You're not, even, you're not even doing this for years. All right, the only thing I am is a mouthpiece. I'm the UPS guy. I'm the FedEx guy. I bring the mail, but I have nothing to do with the package. Do this. This is what God is asking for you, from you. And here's Simon looking at Jesus. I'm pretty sure he was really upset because his mother-in-law was just healed. I'm pretty sure he was like, where is this guy coming from out of nowhere? I have issues. I need to feed my family. I need to put this in order. All I got to do is, all he was thinking about was food and money because that was his livelihood. If he didn't catch fish, he wouldn't eat. If he didn't eat, his wife was upset. If, if, you, know, you know, this is what he had to do to take care of his family. And I think that God understands that we want to take care of our family. God understands that the first thing that we want to do as men, and then some of you as women, is take care of the household. But what Jesus was saying to Simon was this. I know that you're about to follow me. I know that you're about to go on a journey with me. Before you follow me, I will take care of your mother-in-law. I will take care of your wife. Yeah. I will take yes. care of your children. Yes. I will take care of your household. But you yeah. need to learn how to trust yes. me. Yes. Praise God. Yeah. The problem that we have is that we try to be God yeah. in every situation. Yeah. You're not God. Yeah. You do a bad job being God. Yeah. You are not the Holy Spirit. Mm, come on. That's not who you are. And you got to stop trying to be God. Can you imagine being God? Can you imagine answering prayers? Can you imagine trying to, to, to orchestrate something and moving the world? No, you can't do it. You are not called to be Him. Then why are you trying to, to do things that are not in your power? We say we trust the Lord, but do we trust Him? So the book of Luke chapter 5, Jesus says, oh, I'm sorry, I got really loud. Jesus says, let me be here. No, go ahead. Jesus says, Simon, that's two minutes on the other side. Simon says, here comes the show of it all, the one who knows everything. Do just cast a net. If you read it in the NKJV, it says, or in the KJV, it says, just cast a net. Cast a net. So I can see Jesus. He says, I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to go down right now. He cast a net, he kept the other one inside the boat, and all of a sudden there was so much fish coming through that everybody around them had to throw their nets in as well because the catch was so great. Wow. I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. Because the power was not in the net, it was not in the boat. There was no word that was spoken that's right. Come at that very moment. Wow, that's right. good. Yes. And I want to go back to the words that were spoken over this community, yeah. over the people sitting in these chairs, and over the future of this church. Yeah. You may have been fishing. All night. Yeah. You have been fishing for years. You may you have been trying and trying and trying, but there's a word over you. Cast the nets. Yes. Stop casting one. Yeah. Come on. And how do we cast one net? When we do things out of obligation, not out of the heart. Yeah. We do it because we have to. Come on, come on, let's be real. How many of you sometimes come to church because we have to? Mm. Yeah. You know how many times I'll wake up in the morning I've been uh, uh, you know, I think it's a song like, I'll wake up in the morning. You know, I remember how many times I would wake up in the morning. I don't know if the Migo is going to follow me. Hi, Migo. Okay. I don't know how many times you wake up in the morning and it's Sunday. Now, I'm a pastor. And I wake up in the morning on Sundays and, I, and in the beginning of my first years of being a pastor, I was excited because just like you, Jeremy, and just like you, Pops, your parents bought your church. Your body, your clock wakes up every Sunday morning saying it's church. Now, the people who are made out of paper, when they see rain, saying it's not church. <laughs> it's church. When we wake up, we're going to do this. Sometimes we drag our bodies out of the bed and go, oh, dude, when I first woke up, when I first couple of years, I would wake up and I'm a pastor. I'm getting excited because before being a pastor, I was not the preacher. I didn't have to do anything. I was the, the pastor's son, so I had to deal with the equipment in the back. I had to play the drums because that's what all pastor's kids do. Do worship and, and do the, the wire work in the church. That's what right. we do. Right. Forever and ever and ever. Someone knows what I'm talking about. That's, mm -hmm. what, we're, that's what we're made out of. We're made out of wires. And every day I would wake up. And that's what I did. But when I became the pastor, I'd wake up in the morning like, yes! And all of a sudden I would remind myself I'm the pastor. Oh my God. <laughs> I put my head on my head and I'm like, why? Because we lose passion. Because we made it into a job. Because we made it into a casting out of a net, not out of a being obedient to a word. Come on. 
So what is God saying to us? Yeah. He's saying, before I ask you to follow me, I need you to trust me with everything that belongs to you. Wow, come on. I need you to trust me with your family. Yeah. Because if I ask you to follow me, I will take care of your family. Can you say amen to that? Amen. If I ask you to follow me, I will take care of your finances. Amen. If I ask you to follow me, I will take care of your future. Amen. I will take care of your nest egg. I will take care of everything that belongs to you. Can I share something with you that's going to be a smack on the face to some of us, including me? If you never take a risk, you will never give God a chance to show you a miracle. That's right. Come on. That's right. Simon cast it out of net. <clears throat> he threw it into the water. Yeah. He never expected it to come back full. Yeah. It was so full, he lost it. Yeah. This is the reason why Jesus, some others had to receive a part of what belonged to him. This is the reason why Jesus said, cast your nets. And I want to share this with you, and this is going to be mind-boggling for some of you. I want you to hear this. When Jesus asked him to cast his nets, Jesus was not looking at proving a point. Jesus was looking at the fact that, G that Peter, Simon, was about to follow him for three and a half years. He needed to catch so much fish that he would be able to sell those fish in the streets, have enough money to sustain his household for the next three and a half years. Wow. wow. That's good. So is Jesus interested in your finances? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Wake up with me. Yeah. Is Jesus interested in your finances? Yeah. Yeah. Is Jesus interested in your health? Yeah. Yeah. Is he interested in your future? Yeah. Are you interested in trusting him? Jesus, yes. 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 I remember when I um, started full-time ministry, it wasn't, um, it wasn't by choice. It wasn't a choice. I'm going to tell you exactly how it never is. It never is a choice. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you exactly how it happened. I remember um, I was working for A.G. Edwards and Sons. I used to be a brokerage firm. I got in that job by pure miracle. I was uh, I was selling gym memberships, but I didn't use the gym. <laughs> and, and at 11 o'clock at night, this guy meets me and he says to me, he goes, hey, you, you're really good at selling. And I said, yeah, I know I could talk. That's another way of saying it. You're really good at selling things. Why don't you come uh, and work for me? And he threw a book in front of me and the favor of God was on me that in one year, I was a headhunter, and one year I was able to get four brokers to come from, from that place into the new office that we were working in in Fairfield on Pasadena Avenue. Wow. Come on. And I remember I made so much money that year. I was like living, I was a 19, 20 year old kid that was just living with money. I didn't know what, I was, I was very generous at the same time. I was always good to my church and good to my family. And I remember that I made so much, and one day I'm, 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 my mother's receiving the benefits of my finances. I was still living at home, and she, she loved, she loved me more at the time than she did now because there was more money back then. <laughs> I had nice cars, I had really nice things, and here comes a prophetic person, and God, man, those prophetic people aren't they annoying? <laughs> comes into the church and he says, before the end of this year, before the summer comes, you will be in full-time ministry, and I heard my mother say, "Rebuke you in the name of Jesus." All her benefits were going to go away if that happened. <laughs> she was going. She was going shopping a little extra that month. Like she was, she, you know, no, that's not the word of the Lord, son. You're going to do well in ministry, and you're going to do well. And 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 he said, "You're going to leave your job. You're going to do all of this." And I was like, "Okay, if it happens, it happens." And that one year, A.J. Edwards and Sons got bought out by Wachovia Securities, and I stayed. And then Wachovia got bought out by Wells Fargo Advisors, and we received a letter said, you will not be employed after this day. It was exactly from the time, watch this. I lost my job, but with two years of benefits. For the first two years of our ministry, I was able to be sustained for two whole years. I was able to keep the same salary, the same benefits and everything, but I was not a good steward. God was, was taking care of me as I started a church. In, 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 in Clifton, New Jersey, then moving to Garfield. God was able to sustain me for two years with simply a word. I remember that throughout those two years, I was transitioning to a, a lower salary and a lower salary and a lower salary, and I was not able to understand how I was still able to keep my lifestyle and the things that I enjoyed having 
with only 20 to 30 percent of what I was making before. At that moment, I was looking at myself and saying, how is this possible? You know what started to happening? I started to make friends who started to invite me to restaurants, and I didn't have to pay anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, they was feeding me meatballs. <laughs> they were not frozen meatballs from the frozen department. They were real, authentic Italian meatballs. You don't understand. You can't find that nowadays. Made by Mona. But they were made. They were great meatballs. God was sustaining me throughout the season, and then I started to understand that he didn't want me at that place, that he was taking care of everything I needed, and I needed to trust him. And I remember looking at my boss. My boss is a Jewish man. And he walks into my office, and he says these words to me, and it killed me when he said this. He's, he had a Yiddish accent because he was an Orthodox Jew, and he looks at me and he says, son? And I said, yes. He goes, I'm going to lose you. And I said, really, why? He says, the other day, I was watching a, a, a man on the TV, his name is, and he said it this way, Joel Osteen. <laughs> and I saw you. I saw you doing that. He says, I don't know how you've done it, but you barely make phone calls because we have your list, but you make more than anybody else in this place. I know I'm going to lose you, but you're going to do good things. Wow. He looked at me. And he didn't know that as a Jew, he was prophesying over my life yes. and over the future yeah. of, my, of my life. Come on. Yes. A word was setting me apart. Jesus. Now, where am I going with all this? Simon decides to follow Jesus. He decides to do it. He decides to go on that journey with him. He sees that Jesus healed his mother-in-law. He sees that Jesus provided financially for him. And now he's going to go on a journey. But even though he was going on a journey, they didn't mean that he trusted him. <laughs> And I want to come to an end with this. Because we could be doing things, but we may not be doing it with the right heart. Is anybody understanding what I'm talking about this morning? Yeah. There was a story where Jesus is feeding the multitudes. He's feeding the multitudes. But it says that they were coming from a journey from like a trip. They were coming from one city to another and they were on this way to this new place. And it was late at night, and it says that the, the scripture says it was a deserted land, it was a deserted area, there was nothing left. So the disciples say to Jesus, hey, send the people home, there's nothing here to eat, let them go home. And Jesus turns around and looks at them and goes, no, we're going to feed them. The Bible says exactly that Jesus had compassion for yeah. these people. Yeah. If you lose compassion for people, right. you're not in the right church. Yep. How do we lose compassion when we make it about us? But this is what happens. Jesus goes and he looks at him and he says, you're going to feed them. I love this, Jeremy, because the first thing that the disciples said to him was, send them home. Yeah. And then Jesus turns back and says, no, you feed them. <coughs> but we, we only have but a few fishes and a couple of loaves. What do, we, what do you want me to do? Is it five loaves and two fishes? You know what that's translated to nowadays? Yeah. See, I've been a preacher for a while. That's translated to, that's the food for the back area for the leaders and the ministers. While everybody else goes home and goes buy their coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks. Jesus said, you're not eating now. Watch what I'm going to say. You're not eating right now. This is not for you. Yeah. This is for them. Yeah. He says, but how? He says, go give it out. And they divided them into 12 groups. If you look at it, he divides them into 12 groups. He gave one disciple a group each. Boom. He divides them into groups, and the disciples start feeding them. I can imagine how the disciples felt at that moment. I've been doing this for so many years. I've been preaching. I've been worshiping. I've been casting out demons. I've been laying hands on the sick. Everything for all these years. This man still wants me to work? Yes. Why? Because you didn't get it yet. Yeah. Good pastor. Come on. Oh, wow. That's good. You made it about you. Yeah. That's good. And let me tell you what the Lord speaks to me through this. I said, God, we're tired. I want to ask you a question. How many of us, be honest with yourselves, are a little bit tired? Amen. We've been doing this for too long. We've been coming to church for too long. Nothing changes. I want to tell you that God is on the move. What's happening in this room is your fault. Feed them. 
So I can imagine Simon here, here, and I can see Jesus going like this. Jesus saying, I have to teach them. This one day I won't be here. And they have to do this the right way. And I'm going to tell you that Jesus has had so much patience in your problems. He knows your attitude. He knows how you really feel. He knows how you feel about the sister sitting on the other side of the church. He knows how you, how they are. He knows the way they are, but God still called you to have compassion over them and feed them. God still called you to feed your enemies. But I'm going to tell you why. Jeremy, can you bring that table back to me? You didn't know I was going to talk about this, and I didn't know you had communion. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to share with you why. Can you all stand up with me? Bring it, bring it to me. Huh? No, I don't need any keyboards or guitars. I need you right here. I'm going to tell you why. And you know what? I want the whole church just to surround me for a second around this table. Because this is totally prophetic. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to share with you the reason why Jesus did this. Jesus asked them to feed them. Because disciples will feed multitudes. But the disciples will be fed by Jesus before he dies. You've been doing and doing and serving the community and having compassion for people. Sometimes out of biblical obligation and not out of pure passion. But one day, one day Jesus is about to leave. And before he leaves, he's not sitting at the round table with the people who he was healing. He's not sitting at the round table with the people that were outside in the multitudes or at the conferences. He's sitting with his friends. He's sitting with the laborers who sat down with him and saw him cry and saw him have passion. He's sitting with the ones who worked with him day and night, who gave up everything, gave up their life. And he says to them, before I go, before I go, I want you to remember me. And he doesn't, he doesn't ask them to serve anybody. As a matter of fact, he washes their feet. You know what he asked of them? Allow me at this moment, you who are on a journey with me, you who gave your life, allow me now to serve you. Because you gave your years with me. You left your house. You left your family. You did everything. Now I want to serve you. I'm not about to do communion again. I'm not. But this is what God is saying. He's saying, you've been broken. You've been broken. You've gone through a lot. And you did it because of me. And you think I didn't see it? All the years and the labor and the work. Do you think I didn't see it? You know what he did? In his last hours, he didn't go hang out with his mom. He went to hang out with his friends. He knew it was coming, yet he still found time to sit down with them. And this is what God is saying. My whole world could be falling down. Everything could have, is a, I'm about to die. But the most important thing to me is that before I go, I serve you. I can imagine Simon at that very moment. But I think we take this moment and we look at this and we forget that Jesus went on a journey with a couple of guys and their families. Took them with him and shared three and a half years of his life. Discipleship is not a Wednesday night service. Discipleship is not, let's get a book and let's teach. Discipleship is not coming together in the church and singing a few songs. 
The kingdom of God is life together as a body. It's crossing boundaries, crossing cultures, crossing everything, and saying we're going to do this, and we're going to show the world compassion. What we have been taught, we're going to give it to the Lord, give it to the world. You know what the gospel is? The gospel is whatever I have received, I have given. It's funny because this morning, can I borrow your scarf? Yeah, it's a really nice scarf, and it's specifically this morning. I was specifically looking at a, at a man who had some sunglasses, and it had Louis Vuitton on it, just like you see this right here. This is a nice scarf. <laughs> when you see Louis Vuitton, you know what you think of? Please forgive me. Cha-ching, cha-ching. <laughs> Somebody loves her and doesn't love me. That's what you think about. She has a nice house. She has a nice car. That's what you think. You don't know her story. You don't know if she stole it and put it in her purse. You don't know the story. <laughs> Just show you. But you think about the fact that this means something. Because when you, but, but you know what's so funny? You know how smart Louis is? That he's promoting himself by putting his mark on something that you're wearing. So everybody who wears this, you know it means something. It symbolizes something. That's the exact same way Jesus is. When you put on compassion, they should know that you come from Christ. Amen. They should know us by what we do, not by what we say. St. Francis of Assisi said these words. At all times, preach the gospel. When necessary, use words. We don't show Jesus Yet we want Jesus to show up. So I'm going to say this to you. How many times have you sat down with Christ and have allowed him to dictate your life and actually follow what he's asking? He's interested, before asking you to serve him, he's interested in taking care of you. He took care of all of Simon's needs and then he said, come follow me. But let me tell you what was happening. The, the disposition that Simon had in his mind was, it's not enough. I still can't trust you. So I think that Jesus today is asking us, will you trust me? Because you put your dreams to the side, your true dreams, because you're afraid. Because you fall into the systems of this world. God breaks barriers. God breaks systems. God breaks mentalities. He breaks all of that. He's not asking you to fall captive to the systems of this world. He's asking for you to tell this world you're going to fall to my system. Let's pray. Let's pray. Don't wait for me. Thank you, Lord. Here it is. He's saying, you need to trust me. Because even the things that are in your emotions and in your mind, you need to trust me. I, I want to deal with it. I want to deal with the, with the yesteryears. I want to deal with the emotions that you had to deal with, even in your childhood. I want to deal with these things. You think that I don't want to? You've been coming and doing this and doing this, and you, and you just put all of your stuff to the side. And I hear the Lord saying, no. He's saying, no, I want to put my hands on that. You always felt like some of the experiences you've had, you've had like three major experiences that have sustained you in the kingdom. God says, I want to give you more. He says, you've been, you've, been, you've been holding on and you're really good at putting on an act. But God says, you've been holding on. He says, I'm here to remind you who you are. There's so much compassion inside of you. There's so much love, but it's behind barriers and layers of stuff. And you know how to put on an act. And God's saying, I want the act over. I want you to be free. Have compassion, but have compassion for the purpose that God has for you in your life right now. There's so much inside of you. Here, you have served, son. Would you allow me to serve you? Would you eat? Because you've done it for years, you've given so much. Take my life. Take my life. Take, you have served so many for years. 
But now you've given it to the multitudes. But would you allow me? Would you allow me to now serve you? Take it. Take it. I've seen what you've done. Come on, bring up your prayers. Bring up your prayers. Bring up your prayers, church. Bring it up. Bring it up. What am I, what am I gonna do, God? Follow me. Follow me. We made this about systems. You know what we made this about? Three songs, two slow, one fast, a good word, go home. Let's see if we can do it again next week. Have you forgotten to sit at the feet of Christ? Have you forgotten that Jesus spent three and a half years? He knew everything about them. He knew their nightmares. He knew how they how behaved on rainy days. He knew every single, he knew their anxieties. He knew everything about them. That's what discipleship is. To know, to know who you are. To do life together. To put, to put, Jesus wanted to put his hands on Peter's marriage. It wasn't just about the church. It was about the life that these people lived. How they behaved with one another. How they operated daily. It was not just about Sunday. As a matter of fact, it never was about Sunday. You know who made it about Sunday? The Catholic Church made it about Sunday. Amen. Some of you just need to say, I'm sorry. Some of you just need to cry it out. Say, I love you. Is it, you know, I may be a little aggressive right now, but God's not mad at you. God's not mad at you. God's not mad at you. Have compassion. Have compassion. Can you do me a favor? Would you hug someone you've never hugged in this community and have compassion over them right now? Go find someone you've never hugged before. Listen, break boundaries right now. Love them. Just hug them and say, I love you, buddy. Just hug them and say, you know what? Show her the love of Christ. Show her the love of Christ. No, no, wait, wait. Stay there with them. Don't just do this cliche hug. Christian Sunday hug. Show them the love of Christ. They may need a hug right now. Eat. You have a long way to go. Eat. 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 Allow me to serve you. No, stop trying to do it on your own. You've discontinued a lot of your dreams, a lot of your desires and your passions. You said, I'm just going to build this. And then I'll wait for the other stuff to work. God said, it's not like that. I'm not asking you to see things. I'm asking you to be faithful. Eat. Come. Eat. Christina. It's not going to make sense. Eat. You have a long way to go. Eat. You have a long way to go. Hallelujah. Do me a favor. Hallelujah. If you're a germaphobe, you're going to have a hard time. Take Hallelujah. a piece and pass it on and say, we're going to do this together. Take a piece and pass it on. If you're a germaphobe, you're going to have a horrible time. <laughs> if you have the measles, take this piece. <laughs> One. Thank you for having me today, guys. God bless you. Love you.